The Firm, India's only show on corporate law, tax and audit matters. Disclosures, disclosures, disclosures. SEBI wants India Inc. to reveal more details on key material events such as acquisitions, amalgamations and even family agreements. That seems to be the main focus of SEBI's new listing regulations. The new regulations issued last week replace the listing agreement including clause 49 and 128 allied SEBI circulars. They apply to all entities that have listed equity shares or convertible securities, a variety of debt securities, preference shares, Indian depository receipts, securitized debt instruments and mutual fund units. Do the listing regulations promise to usher in a new era of transparency? Joining me today to answer that question are three of India's best-known capital market lawyers. JSA Somasekhar Sundaresan, Yash Asher of Cyril Amarchand Mangaldas and Sandeep Bhagat of SNR. Gentlemen, to all three of you, a warm welcome to the firm. So, uh, the conversion of what was the listing agreement, including the dreaded clause 49 and about 128 other circulars, into now a better enforceable regulation just means better enforcement, right? Yeah, in terms of uh, instrument of law, hmm. the regulation is a known instrument pursuant to an act of parliament. This gets tabled in parliament for 30 days. So, enforcement uh, quality wise, hmm. it's a more binding uh, instrument of law Correct. as compared to a circular or guidelines. So, I think it makes an important change. Earlier, if the enforcement of any provision had to be made under the listing agreement, which was a contract between the stock exchanges and issuer companies, SEBI had to go through the stock exchanges. Hmm. SEBI could not directly you know access the issuer company unless there was a breach of some other regulation because now with the regulation mm -hmm. it sort of allows i would think sebi direct access though of course this has also increased the responsibility of the stock exchanges which otherwise was not clear you could argue within the ex uh, existing provisions so i think therefore it's important i think the second thing which it does which is very important is we had a series of detailed requirements for companies when they went public mm. but after they went public it was silence. Very okay. rarely do you get disclosure quality, quality disclosure. Right. So with this new sort of regulation, I think the detail that companies now have to follow post-listing is almost as much as they have to do during listing. So I think that's again a great change which I think will improve disclosure. You know, I, I loved what I read. Uh, I didn't read all 111 pages, but at least whatever pertained to equity, because simply as Yash point, pointed out, the extensive disclosures required by companies pre and post listing uh, and I'm just going to list or talk about some of the mandatory disclosures to give viewers a sense of really how far this uh, set of regulations goes for instance not only do you have to disclose all your acquisitions but even an acquisition of just five percent in any uh, entity has to be disclosed so essentially anything that you acquire five percent and more has to be disclosed as an acquisition the sale of a unit division subsidiary doesn't matter how big or small needs to be disclosed. Any restriction on transferability of securities needs dis disclosures. Alterations of calls, disclosures. Rating revisions, companies are you know fabulously lax at not putting out that information, disclosures. Shareholder agreements, well that was expected. Joint venture agreements, sort of expected. Family settlement agreements, totally not expected. They've said now relevant portions of that, relevant to the listed entity, must be disclosed. Corporate debt restructuring, you need disclosures. One-time settlements with banks, my heart is singing as a journalist. I'm delighted. My only question is, are companies really going to be able to do all of this? Is this going to mean more transparency or are they just going to dump fine print on us? I think uh, most market participants' heart will sing uh, looking at this. Mm -hmm. But one should also worry about the cacophony. Uh, if you don't really orchestrate uh, the multiple uh, noises that come out, it can lead to a very noisy environment. Uh, personally, the one element that I feel uh, is a bit of a step back okay. is removing materiality for disclosures such as acquisitions. Okay. So, you don't Size want a 5,000 crore company having to disclose a 5 crore asset acquisition because it fits within the term acquisition. Mm. So, I do think that in that element, it's been a bit of a step back. When we're talking harm, about though? when you're talking about an IPO or disclosure reform, we're talking about the need to bring in materiality. When we're looking at presumption, rebuttable presumptions of price-sensitive information under insider trading, 
we are talking about materiality and then to say during the life of a listed company regardless of materiality some things have to be disclosed I think that's conceptually a little bit of a step back I don't know I can't see what the harm is so I understand that it's going to mean a lot more paperwork a lot more information out there investors will have to sift through it but why should a 5000 crore rupee company not disclose you know a 5 crore Look, rupee acquisition I mean, or an investment of 5% and more it's <laughs> only a disclosure what's so think, the problem Manika I think let's step back so I think where we were so the existing clause 36 prior mm. to these regulations was bare bone and most CFOs and managing directors would fight with you saying the disclosure is not required doesn't fit in within the framework we want to completely the other extreme where it's not just a 5 crore bit if you look at the disclosure requirement you have to give a lot more detail hmm. so for example if there is a pharma company in India which has a subsidy in Brazil which has a subsidy in Portugal and it does a small acquisition in in say Nigeria hmm. you have to now put the disclosure out which is you know there's going to be a lot more disclosure so that you know leads to the cacophony that that Soam referred to and then people will not be able to understand what is the impact whether it makes any sense or not if you held 10% in a company and acquire more, another 10% again you have to make disclosure even if it's a really small well, what again is the problem there you have excessive disclosure you end up risking making market participants think inconsequential events as being consequential and therefore swinging. We also have cases of SEBI being very upset with companies for disclosing all sorts of contracts on a regular basis and using it as a tool for upward price manipulation. You so mean like interest bagging in infrastructure order kind yeah. of thing? Yeah, and equally there have been people who have been punished for not reporting bagging a contract or losing a contract. So I think materiality is the key to resolve this problem okay. and to then say materiality will not matter is not conceptually a right thing to do. You know, okay, I'm, I'm going to take this question one step forward, Sandeep. Not only has SEBI mandated what you need to disclose, they have in a subsequent circular also put out details on what details you must provide in that disclosure, right? Again, my heart sinks. They've said, for instance, you know, a company must disclose if it has defaulted on paying the FCCB coupon. And not only disclose that if you've defaulted, but also what corrective measures you are taking. These are not things we heard from companies, you know, before. I mean, companies would rarely tell you. I could list a whole bunch of other details, any special rights, privileges, uh, interest attached to debt securities, any restriction on transferability. You have to explain why there is a restriction, right? Affirmative rights being granted granted to shareholders in a joint venture agreement, you need to disclose that in detail and SEBI's provided what detail and how much detail. These are things that shareholders never got to see. I think this is a reform in the ongoing secondary market disclosure we have. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think it was needed. There, the general perception is that while there is good amount of disclosure at the time of the initial public offering, ongoing secondary market disclosure in India is average to poor right. so I think I think there was a need for the regulator to have come out with a set of regulations which tightened the framework currently I think you know we can debate on materiality I mean the US for example took it one step further and in 2002 for example said you not only do all this you actually file your acquisition agreement hmm. okay you file your material agreement with the regulator that before they implemented that there was a lot of resistance by corporates by industry and now you know those agreements are actually pretty good to look at yeah. for, for for any particular you know understanding of a listed company I don't think our regulators taken it that far they have certainly removed the element of discretion with certain companies I think after December 1 listed companies have to seriously look at their disclosure obligations mm. and have to seriously look and say this is what is mandatory what what this is not i i don't disagree with Soam and yash that maybe we could have had a bit of materiality play more i think the regulator itself has said if you can't disclose for example something in, in you know in in these items you need to tell why yeah. so maybe Part of the analysis which listed companies will do is they will say, okay, we need to disclose the following 10 items. Let's consider why we don't need to disclose one or two and give the reasons for that and disclose that publicly. And but let's see how SEBI reacts to right. that. Right, but I think, I think as an overall, to, to me, overall, this is strengthening it. secondary market disclosure. At least to me, uh, this is an important step forward. I think we can debate on whether they've gone too far or not. The acquisition part is a problematic part and you will end up having a fair bit of cacophony. But is that okay? Is it's, that your only noise. objection? That, it's that, noise. That, it's it's a lot of noise 
and noise drowns could be, out analysis. And sometimes okay. there could be confidentiality okay. clause issues, but again, that also one can. I, yes, no, I agree so with you. No, 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 I agree with you. I no, have seen companies hide behind. I that know, but I agree with you. Even material, you know. I agree because I think the test so I use so. at least is confidentiality balanced with insider trading. And what is price sensitive? Many a time, senior employees, etc., may be trading, so therefore it can't be confidentiality because there's some people trading. But that could be one of the arguments. I, I agree with you. Indian companies. I'm so sorry to generalize this. I don't often do this, but Indian companies suck at disclosures, and I think this is a huge step forward in at least asking them to start reviewing their disclosure policies and making more information available, despite the discomfort, just the minor discomfort on the fringe that it's causing in that sense. I don't think any of you principally disagree. With the the fact that we need more disclosure, don't, don't right. principally disagree. That's it, yeah. It's good that you know for certain events, discretion is no longer there. To be fair, they have left something to a company's materiality policy, right? Yeah. They've said that for a variety of issues, for instance, like uh, you know impact of new regulations or product launches, loan agreements, capacity additions, we are asking the companies to devise their own materiality yeah. policy, uh, you know, and then determine whether these events are material as, as per your policy and therefore have to be disclosed or not. So so they have left some of it to the company's so discretion. there are two parts, right? Yeah. So one is where materiality is irrelevant, the other is where materiality is relevant. And there too the good part is they have given about a three qualitative criteria on mm. how do you determine materiality yeah. and all those are excellent. There is also some guidance they provided in the subsequent circular on when an event or information has occurred and therefore when it needs to be disclosed. I was a little confused by this. So I'm just going to put up an illustration out there. This is something we run into very commonly in the media. Uh, we hear of negotiations of an acquisition. You want to report it, you report it. A company will come back with a fairly motherhood statement saying, you know, we don't comment on speculative issues. Does this guidance compel them to share more information at that stage of negotiation or does this guidance say well you don't need to share any information at all until you have taken the acquisition to your board well, how have you interpreted this yeah I, I think it's the way we are currently doing uh, any transaction until it reaches a binding definitive agreement stage the advice today still is it's speculative and you should not be telling the market that you have a transaction once you have a definitive agreement then you disclose that I think this is simply adding to that particular guidance and saying that if there are certain types of events which require board or shareholder approval disclose it at that point certain types of events you know you have an earthquake you have fire in your facility you should be disclosing that as soon as you come to know so I think I think so the an acquisition would fall into your uh, into, into the, the first category which is which that is at the point there is a decision made on the acquisition and by the, the board by the board decision on a binding agreement agreement I mean you may decide to scout for targets you may decide to entertain an acquirer hmm. uh, but there's many a slip between the cup and the lip you may not really take it to fruition so the issue of when do you talk about it goes back to again it mirrors your uh, making true statements under your FUTP regulations mm. so you can't be giving information as if it were true uh, when it is not really firm and binding so that space remains the same it's it's nothing's really changed there okay so have we covered disclosures in the detail that we uh, ought to have on this discussion the addition uh, Menaka is they've added a level of disclosure to material subs so earlier so they had identified material subsidies and they had given you guidance on some procedural aspects that independent director on the board of the listed company has to be nominated on the material subsidiary I think now they've given you detailed requirements of what you have to comply with in relation to material subsidiary so I think that again is a good step in disclosure mm. it forces companies now to give what's happening below the company which many companies still now are perhaps avoiding oh, only one other point Menaka was Listed companies should now start looking at their websites a little bit more carefully. I think in what they disclose on their websites, hmm. the, there are specific regulations now on what should be disclosed on the website, including the fact that the website needs to be updated within two days of any change in event. Hmm. And what you disclose to the stock exchanges, you've got to disclose it on your website and leave it there for five years mm -hmm. or longer if you have a document retention policy. They also, I think, put a time limit now saying board decisions have to be communicated to the exchange within 30, sec 30 minutes, right? Yeah, it used to be 15 earlier. The only yeah. thing on that board part, I think the only thing which I have an issue with is earlier if you were doing an issuance of equity, hmm. you did not have an obligation to intimate exchanges prior to the board meeting. 
And I thought that was a correct position. It allowed board to discuss it and independent directors to give in their thoughts whether there was a requirement for dilution or not. They've changed that in the new regulation. So now you need to give prior intimation of two working days even if you're going to do an issuance of equity of any sort. Or if it's on your agenda. If it's on the agenda, which means, Manaka, in simple terms, if I'm the independent director on a company, if I'm going to go there and counter the existing management and say, I don't think this company should do a dilution now, it should probably wait six months, it's not going to count for much because the whole world knows and expects that it's going to be a dilution and for two working days, it's already been there, out there on the exchanges to see. So I think it's a bit unfortunate. We should have, globally, it's not required. This is a matter which the board has to discuss and once the board discuss, then you intimate it. Okay. So that I thought was unnecessary, but that's probably the only sort of issue where I've deferred with the thoughts on how this okay. could work. Alright, then we've got disclosures covered, the key disclosures that companies need to make and the details they need to provide in those disclosures. We'll take a quick break on the firm, but when we come back, we'll talk about SEBI's new provisions on related party transactions and the reclassification of promoters. One of the other things I was looking forward to in these regulations is what SEBI decides to do with regards to related party transactions and whether it aligns itself with the amended uh, Companies Act. Well, it's partly aligned itself, right? So the Companies Act says special resolution not required anymore, only ordinary resolution. SEBI has towed that line. But the Companies Act says only that related party which has an interest in that transaction cannot vote. SEBI has maintained its previous position and said no related party can vote on that particular related party transaction when it goes to shareholder approval. Uh, it's a part alignment. I think it's a good alignment unless you see operational issues in the fact that, you know, the two don't speak the same language. I think it's part alignment, but there's still a bit of dissonance between the two. For example, the listing regulations deal only with material related party transactions. Correct. Companies act regardless of materiality. Says yeah. if it's arm's length and in the ordinary course, yeah. you don't need to go to shareholders. Correct, yeah. So there is, it's not completely aligned. There's still a dichotomy. Uh, also, what is a related party? What is a related party transaction? This is an amalgam. Yeah. yeah. So those those there are the, it isn't. Sorry. Yeah. Th those differences ha existed earlier as well. I think the advice to clients is if you're if you're a listed company doing a related party transaction, you need to look carefully at the Companies Act, look carefully at the listing at the uh, at the listing regulations. Correct. And each one you need to you know look at it almost separately. Make sure you comply with both. Okay. Uh, There's only one area of doubt I had here. In 2013, Sebi put out two circulars regarding schemes that involved uh, you know transactions with promoters uh, or arrangements with promoters, and in that they had said that in such schemes uh, you would need a majority of minority or majority of public shareholders to approve it and they also put in some other requirements such as you need an independent valuers report etc. There is no explicit reference to any of that in this listing regulation. So what happens? I mean does the R, do the RPT provisions apply to schemes as well? So the circulars repeat. Huh. So everything that's not now in the regulation uh, is out. So the reference to valuation report is out. It's out. Uh, it's out. Okay. But clearly you could argue that the a scheme with a related party is a material related party transaction okay. and one could argue, uh, it's not very clear as you rightly highlight, but it could be argued that the uh, consent of the public shareholders, the hmm. non-related party shareholders is still a requirement. So majority of minorities still that applies that, yeah. for schemes as well. Yeah. I think at some point the regulator will have to reveal its mind and clarify it further because earlier you could take a view that a special law overrides a general law. When there was a special explicit circular Correct. dealing with it, you didn't have to look at the listing agreement for right. that. Yeah. Now it's all come into a regulation and the circular is gone. Yeah. So if the intention was to treat a scheme like a related party contract and therefore take approval, hmm. then again you've got to build this dynamic between a court meeting, which is actually a court convened meeting, as opposed to a shareholder resolution under company law. Hmm. Where you got to take a, a vote of the shareholders? How right. do you that's uh, why align the two processes? This would not strictly it's fall under an RPT right. transaction definition, um, and yet they've re rescinded that circular. We'll have to read together with the earlier bits on sale of assets, etc. So a lot of disclosure would anyway come in there. I don't know if this is this listing regulations itself are the end of it, or they're going to issue more regulations or circulars. Okay, just <laughs> so for example, pages plus another hundred. Well, they've already issued a circular. 
there are other various, you know, you know, for example, they've said uh, there's this annual disclosure requirement. You know, we'll have to wait for regulation. So maybe, and you know, even in the scheme thing, there's something under regulation 37.4 which says anything else which SEBI may prescribe from time to time. Huh. So we don't know if it's the end of it or if the regulator comes so up with something. So my answer will lie in some future. We don't know. Okay, okay final on. point. They have included in these new regulations, the new board approvals, that's the SEBI board approvals, uh, to creating a framework for reclassification of promoters. This is the first time we have it in the country. Therefore, it's the first time that it's in these new regulations and it makes for the third new thing that I wanted to talk about. It's great we have a framework, but there do seem to be some very restrictive clauses in this framework. Uh, and I wanted to ask you whether, in all three of you, whether this is a viable framework or not. For instance, it goes on to say that an entity may be considered professional as long as no person or group of persons holds more than 1% of the equity of that in, you know, company. I don't know too many companies where nobody will hold 1% or more and H&I may hold 2 or 3 or 4%. So I'm just curious to know whether you think this is a viable framework at all. No, so I think uh, the important point, Manika, is and one could argue separately whether the listing regulation was a correct place to put this entire framework. But there was a gap in, in this entire sort of issue and lots of companies had this peculiar issue where pe promoters had sold. For example, in Satyam, when the incident happened, Ramalingam Raju held like 1.8%. Mm -hmm. as shareholding. So I think from that perspective, so a bad example, professionally managed under this uh, uh, good or bad example, but I think separately, this now has a framework. What you pointed out is one particular clause, but that clause itself excludes mutual funds and other criteria. It doesn't qualified. exclude private equity. It doesn't, doesn't include, private include equity. Uh, high net worth investors. So but I think I'd read it with 6-1 and there's an argument. And separately, the same regulation provides that if you have any sort of issue, you can go to SEBI. SEBI itself had a difficulty up to now on how to entertain these requests where companies said we don't have a promoter or I'm named as promoter but I don't hold a single share, I don't have a board sheet, I have no rights. Hmm. Why am I being called a promoter of this company? Hmm. SEBI said I can't help you because I don't have a regulation. At least now there's a regulation. It's also yeah. very confusingly written, so I'm not sure what you make of it. Is it viable? Is it workable? Does it really create space for, let's say, companies like Infosys or other professionally run companies where there is no identifiable promoter anymore? So I think uh, we'll, have, we'll have to take a step back. I mean, this whole promoter overhang over corporate India is a legacy of many, many decades. And we're not yet able to shrug ourselves off this legacy and look at potentially listing companies with no promoters. Hmm. This whole craving to identify a promoter, uh, put him up there, uh, lenders asking him to give personal guarantees, all that continues in society today. Hmm. So you see a bit of a concept note in this regulation rather than a hard rule or a provision of law. Uh, at least it articulates a concept that a company needn't have a promoter, or the same promoter all its life. So looks at two scenarios. One is where there's a new incoming promoter who buys the existing guy out. Hmm. And the other is where the existing guy just dissolves. Like the example Yash gave where the promoter's holding gets diluted over time. And then and you the apply the barometer of whether it's professionally managed or not. Yeah. So at least it's a start. I, I think many other For instance, the first instance you pointed yeah. out where you said a current promoter is being replaced by a new incoming promoter, let's yeah. say because it's of easy. an acquisition, yeah. right? The current it's, it's promoter should not have more than 10%. No, the, 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 yeah, the, the, the outgoing. The outgoing. Should well, it doesn't it. specify I that think, as we I discussed earlier. I think 10% earlier. is a very material holding. <coughs> Under company law, you can force... It should not have any special rights. I, I don't yeah, know. You you can, could, I could ask you can force, why does it matter? You can Somebody force the in, in, he's choosing to become promoter. Yeah, but if the outgoing guy is more than 10 and he can choose to call a board meeting, uh, a shareholder meeting at will, or he can take the company to oppression and mismanagement proceedings, it's a material threshold. It's a decent bright line to apply. If there are companies where I want to continue to appoint a director, or I want to continue to do other activities, I want to continue to be MD of the board. Then you must stay then on Then you, you stay as promoter. There are some, you, you so so there are some good criteria, like yeah. saying you can have a three-year transition employment contract. To yeah, so the outgoing it, promoter can continue approved. to be a key yeah, manager. So person at least three it's, it's a path in the So right the problem direction. lies in the second instance, which is that if the current promoter's stake has diminished to an extent where the company wants to call itself now a professionally managed company and nobody wants to be classified as promoter, that's where you're, you run into a bit of stickiness because that 1% right. threshold there... You may fall between the stools because yeah. somebody is above one. Yeah. And then you start dragging him in. 
and forcing him yeah, to become a promoter I, in that sense. I think both five and six could do with changes. Mm. I think in five, which they've talked about, ten percent. I think my view is if there's a new guy coming in, he controls the company. He's saying I'm the promoter. He's made an open offer. So how does it matter? Uh, why does it matter if holds? somebody else holds ten percent or twelve percent or fifteen percent? I think that to me, you know, it does give some. And, and maybe the answer to that is what Yash and Soma are saying. Go to the regulator and say, you know, give us an exemption. I think one percent is a fairly low threat in that yeah. particular thing. Maybe that could have been a little higher and maybe the, the one in five, you know. So work in we, progress? I, 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 maybe. It's a good oh, start. Yeah. It's, it's a great start and I think we'll okay. see a lot of companies probably go on to this and test this very soon. Okay. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me on this edition of The Firm and thank you very much for watching. We'll be back next week. The Firm, India's only show on corporate law, tax and audit matters.